One of my favorite topics to discuss uh, in this class and outside of this class is obesity, weight management, energy balance. And one of the things I find very uh, frustrating when you have any conversations in that realm is that a lot of people make a statement that well drives me crazy and that statement is when it comes to obesity for instance people will say well people should just eat less and exercise more they should just eat less and move more and that it while true <laughs> that that can help to potentially reduce um adiposity fat mass on the body it's not that simple telling people to eat less and exercise more isn't enough to promote behavior change. Obesity, health behaviors, health in general are complex concepts and obesity for instance is not caused by one thing in everyone. And so why I bring this up is that it's so important for us to move away from simplistic answers to complex problems or simplistic framing of complex problems. And that is why this unit is so important because I want to introduce us to thinking more in systems, understanding that health behaviors, health outcomes are caused by a complex array of factors that are often unique to a population or an individual. And if we don't consider those complex set of factors and circumstances, then we're often not getting to the heart of the problem and we're just like wasting our time. You're wasting your time if you're telling people to just eat less. That's not, if you're, you're wasting your time if you're telling people just, just don't smoke, just move more, right? That's not enough. We have to understand the complexity of human behavior and the complexity of health promotion. And that's why we need to start thinking in systems. So health promotion is typically not simple. Typically not. I'll give you an example of when it can be a little bit more on the simple or what we might call the complicated side of things. Um, an example is like the development of goiter. Uh, goiters can develop uh, due to iodine deficiency where that thyroid gland kind of overcompensates and gets really large as it tries to make iodine, make um, the thyroid hormones, which is not able to do. So we know that the solution for goiter is to increase iodine, right? It's caused by an iodine deficiency, so we need to increase iodine. Simple cause, more or less simple solution, right? So the solution is to eat more iodine, which is a simple solution, but how do you do that at the population level? Well, they kind of came up with a solution that was a little bit more on the simplistic side of things, which means to add iodine to, because it's colorless, because it's odorless, they can add that to like table salt. And most of the table salt we get in North America is iodized. It has iodine in it, which helps prevent the development of a goiter. Now in a lot of the world that has this iodine supplementation, we don't have to worry about goiter anymore. Okay, so that's an example of a health promotion, a health issue with that's kind of simple. It's got like one root cause is iodine deficiency. And because it has one root cause, actually treating it is fairly simple as well, that we just have to kind of fix that root cause. And there's a way to do that in a more simplistic way because it is tasteless and odorless. But usually health promotion is not simple, right? So a good example of this is you know, we know physical activity is one of the best things you can possibly do for your health, but most Canadians, well, about half Canadians, aren't getting the recommended amounts of physical activity. So how do we do that? How do we get people to exercise or move their bodies more? <laughs> we're not doing it. <laughs> Whatever it is, we're not doing it. We still haven't figured out how to encourage long-term engagement in physical activity across the heterogeneous population that we see in North America. Why? Because the reasons that are leading to a lack of physical activity are often really individual, really circumstantial, really environmental, and can fluctuate. They can change over time as well. Human behavior is highly complex and hard to predict. So we can't just apply a simple solution. There's no simple like, just add physical activity to the water <laughs> solution here to promote um, engagement in physical activity across a population. So we have to move away from this reductionist thinking and health promotion. Reductionist thinking is like 
it's reducing, reduce, 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 like here's a bigger problem. Let's reduce that down to one simple cause or one simple solution. So for instance, what I hear a lot in the, you know, weight management world, the diet world is, you know, people should just cut out sugar. They may make it seem like all of obesity is due to excess sugar consumption. And granted, that is one part of the problem. That is one side of it that we're consuming too much added sugars. But there's so many reasons why we're doing that, right? There's so many like physiological reasons why, because we, you know, we can develop a a taste for sugar and there's an evolutionary reason for that but also our environment is one that we get pushed these types of foods on us so reducing the obesity epidemic <laughs> to just we eat too much sugar that that doesn't get us anywhere and that doesn't really address the problem it's more complex than that right there are many interacting elements within a system that lead to a particular situation you know, if someone develops obesity, there's usually a number of reasons why that has occurred. And it is, it's all over the place. I love complexity. I embrace complexity, but it can be a bit overwhelming because it's hard to know kind of where to start when trying to manage or reduce the adiposity in, that an individual has. It's more work to not do reductionist thinking. It's more work to do that because we have to start thinking about all the different factors that are associated with that particular situation and all the different factors that potentially might work in a particular population to change up that particular thing. Okay. So an example, another example of reductionist thinking that I see this a lot when people talk about the brain, you know, we, I teach anatomy as well. And we have to be careful with something like the brain is highly complex and like integrated and everything speaks to everything else in the brain, not everything, but there's a lot of connections in the brain. Sometimes when we learn about the brain, we have to simplify it and be like, okay, well, you know, Wernicke's area does this, Broca's area does this, the primary motor cortex does this, the visual area does this, etc. It's easy to kind of reduce the brain to like, boom, this does this, this does that, that does that, but that's not how the brain works. The brain talks to itself and talks to the rest of the body and receives information from the rest of the body. And yeah, it helps us with our understanding of the brain to like talk about it in places, but, and that's a good place to start. Our understanding of the brain is to talk about the different regions, but we have to understand that it's all connected. And, and like the beauty of the human brain, the brain is just so incredible. I'm obsessed with the human brain. but we really start to like unlock the beauty and magic and like <laughs> unknowability of the brain when we actually start looking at the connections that exist, right? So reductionist thinking of the brain is just going to look at the different parts. A more system thinking view of the brain is going to talk about how the parts connect to each other, right? That's a big difference in reductionist thinking versus systems thinking, right? Reductionist thinking, we're thinking about one thing and what it does Systems thinking is like, okay, there's a bunch of things that do a bunch of things. How do they work together? Okay. So giving you some more example, because this isn't uh, a simple concept to grasp. It's taken me many years to grasp this concept myself, but we often use reductionist thinking. So for instance, some people might, someone has depression and they were like, well, they went through something so that they developed depression. Really? Is that always the case? for everyone that that is what leads to an experience of depression or major depressive disorder. There's often a number of factors, including genetics, including early life circumstances, including, you know, what's going on physiologically as well, including how much, you know, physical activity that person does. There's so much going on and way beyond that as well that can lead to a mental health um, illness, mental, a mental illness. So, when we think of things with a simplistic perspective, our solutions are simplistic as well. And if you've ever dealt with depression, um, which is very common, that doesn't mean there's anything wrong with you. Like it's, please know that that's very important. Um, and I hate to just kind of talk about this so quickly, but anyways, if you've ever dealt with depression and someone's told you the ridiculous statement, which is just be happy, right? You know, or just change that, you know, you went through a breakup well, or your partner's bad and they're, you know, caught in part leading to what you're experiencing. So just get rid of your partner. So the problem's gone. Everything's fine. 
right? The solution isn't simple when it comes to something complex like that. The, sim the solution to homelessness for those experiencing homelessness that are unhoused, that is not simple either, right? It's not as, not as easy as like, oh, you can't afford rent, so that's what leads to being unhoused, right? So what do we just give people money to afford rent? We just set up shelters and that's going to eliminate um, the issue of individuals being unhoused. It's way more <laughs> complex than that. And it really depends on the individual what's going on, right? And like I, the example I gave earlier, another thing we often reduce to obesity to or what we reduce obesity to is usually just eating too much and not moving enough. So what we just tell people to eat less and move more, do we just eliminate processed food from the food environment, which is super hard to do. That is not easy to do. But let's say we do that, does just obesity go away? Uh, it'd probably get better. <laughs> but even doing this, this is not simple. This is a very difficult thing to do. So hopefully these examples give you some perspective on what reductionist thinking might look like and what some of the problems with that is. And this is from our reading this week. Unless a patient population is fairly homogenous, standardized behavior interventions are unlikely to be uniformly, uniformly effective. So we have to understand that when working with populations, the reason they are at their current health state and the reason that they are engaging in the current behaviors they're engaging in, it's very individual, changes over time. It's usually a number of factors, a combination, how those factors work together. Not one factor, but how a bunch of different factors work together that is promoting that particular health outcome or that particular health behavior. Okay, so thinking in systems, when I say thinking in systems, I'm thinking like we're not just looking at one part. We're looking at the different parts and how they work together. So a system, a system is a set of things people, cells, molecules, whatever, interconnected, that's the big word here, the connections are what matters, right? That they produce their own pattern of behavior over time, right? So the brain is a good example here. If I just look at the somatosensory cortex and I use that as for my understanding of the brain, that doesn't tell me even a third, <laughs> a tenth of what the brain does. It's part of it, it's part of our sensing apparatus, right? But it doesn't give us a full view of the brain. So if we were to break down the brain to just that, we are, we're missing so much and we're not going to fully understand it, right? So the behavior of one part of the brain doesn't tell me what the whole thing is doing together. In a system, it's all the interconnected parts that are leading to that, that are leading to this kind of emergence of a particular behavior, a particular outcome, or a particular phenomenon that we're noticing, okay? So a complex system is a system, we just learned what a system is, in which the function behavior of the entire system is not obvious from the individual parts of the system. So for instance, if I'm using obesity again, which is a complex system, especially at the population level, but also at the individual level, if I were to just look at someone's physical activity behavior, that doesn't paint the entire picture of, you know, what's leading to their current level of adiposity. Even if we just look at like what they eat one day, you know, or what they eat for lunch or how much sugar a person's taking in, that doesn't give the full picture. Because again, when it comes to sugar intake, for instance, there's so many different things that can go into that. Maybe they're using that sugar as a coping mechanism. Maybe they have developed a preference for sugar over years and years because that's what their parents fed them when they were young and it felt like love <laughs> when they were fed sugar. And of course, there is like the, the physiological adaptations to a high sugar intake as well. Okay, so health behavior change is complex. How complex systems and concepts generally have many causes, interactions between causes, and feedbacks exist in systems. And I'll get to feedback in a second. So in complex systems, the laws that describe the behavior of, behavior of the whole are different from the laws that govern the behavior of the parts, which means, again, that we can't just try to understand health outcomes or health behaviors based on one factor all these different things are working together to promote that particular behavior on a particular day even, and to promote that particular health outcome. Why people don't like to think 
with a complex systems view is because it's harder to do, especially if you don't embrace complexity. I embrace complexity. I freaking love it. I think it's so fascinating how like unpredictable humans are. I just think that makes us cool. <laughs> and it makes each individual quite different. But but it's overwhelming when you sit down to try to do something with a health problem and you're like, oh my God, <laughs> there's so much to think about and there's so much to like, there's so many variables at play, right? Complex problems are harder to pin, pin down and, and we're gonna see this in the next module as well. They are less knowable. It's less knowable what's going to reduce a person's adiposity in the long term. It's less knowable what's gonna actually cause someone to quit smoking. It's less knowable what's gonna lead someone to, or lead a population to sleep more or get outside more, or spend more time in nature. It's hard to know this. And you kind of have to embrace that, right? So as a result, focusing on defining the causes of the problem, while I'm not saying that's not important, and that's what you know a literature base is for, and that's important to know the causes of the problem. But, and this kind of speaks a little bit more to solutions to complex problems, What's actually often more effective when we're talking about solutions is figuring out what works for who under what conditions. And then, <laughs> which means a little bit of trial and error. And it also means when it comes to health promotion programs, having a little bit of customization and also getting to know your population and what they're about. So you can try to come up with solutions that are meaningful to them and that actually like make sense right? And that are valuable as well. So to really bang in this concept about what a complex system looks like, I think it's important to discuss what makes a system complex, right? So, and differentiate that from what makes a, a system more simple or what we call complicated. And I'll differentiate between simple and complicated in the next module. But a complex system, its parts are more heterogeneous. They're more different right? Whereas a simple or complicated system, the parts are more homogenous. So there's a visual representation of heterogeneity. And then we're talking about a population, there's tons of heterogeneity. The human body, there's tons of heterogeneity across a population. In a complex system, things often don't occur in a very linear way, right? Linear would suggest this, Non-linearity, actually that's not the best example of non-linearity, but non-linearity might look more like that, right? Where, you know, things fluctuate, they don't just happen in a dose-response kind of way, which we're more likely to see in a linear, more deterministic type of, of simpler, complicated system. Complex systems are more unpredictable, they're more random in nature as well, and there's a lot more like change over time. And obesity is a great example of this because the things that promote your uh, eating and moving behaviors when you're 20 are going to be very different that promote or hinder those behaviors when you're 35, when you're 40, when you're 50, when you're 60, and so on. Um, in a simple or complicated uh, system, it's just like you're looking at one factor independently and it kind of is not influenced by as many other factors. Whereas in a complex system, things are more interdependent, they're linked up, right? You have different categories, each of these little category, and each of those is kind of linked to each other. There's more of that interdependence. Whereas a simple or complicated system, maybe there's just more like A leads to B, right? Whereas in a complex system, there's a lot more of that interdependence. In a complex system, there's more feedback. We're going to get back to this in the next couple of slides, but this is an example of feedback where like one factor leads to another, which leads to another, which comes back to like reinforce or balance out that system. Okay, and I'll get more specific, like I said, in the next, in somewhere in the next slides. I don't remember what slides are next. Okay, and then I won't focus on these too much because this, I find these concepts a bit harder to explain, but concept, comp, Complex systems is just like, <laughs> you know, you put out all the little elements of a system together and they'll organize in a particular way. They'll self-organize, right? And then with a complex system as well, the behavior of the system is different than the individual behavior of the parts, which is a concept that, that's linked to this concept of emergence, okay? But really, 
these are kind of the main aspects of complex systems that I want to remind us that things are a little more unpredictable. Things are more different. They're different between people. They're different within people as well. They're different at different points in time. Lots of different things come in to like lead to that particular factor. There's lots of interdependence and they're like, like I said, unpredictable as well. So when we're actually looking at solutions to complex problems, sometimes one of the things we want to focus on is like, where's there a feedback loop? And is that feedback loop reinforcing a particular behavior or is it like balancing it out? So a balancing feedback loop, which you've heard of in your physiology courses when you talk about negative feedback, right? And we often see like, a particular tissue will release a particular, let's say, hormone. That hormone has an effect on a factor. And then there's a messaging back to that original tissue saying, well, don't secrete any more of that particular hormone because everything's balanced out, right? That's a balancing feedback loop. Balancing feedback loops kind of promote homeostasis. And we have a bunch of them in our body that make sure that like, you don't just secrete more and more and more and more and more of that particular hormone from the tissue. Okay, so balancing feedback loops help to make sure that things stay kind of more stable. So an example of a negative feedback loop or a balancing feedback loop, you'll see like a negative <laughs> somewhere instead of like two positives where things like reinforce themselves. So for instance, as there's more prey, there's more like little bunny rabbits <laughs> in a particular area, right? That promotes an increase in predator numbers. There's more predators that can eat and survive. But we don't just want predator numbers to go crazy and prey numbers to go crazy as well because that shifts us out of like an ecological homeostasis. As predator numbers go up, they hunt more prey, which leads to less prey numbers, right? Less prey numbers is going to also affect predator numbers. So it kind of balances itself out so it doesn't kind of spin out of control. Whereas a reinforcing feedback loop, this is something you want to look at in a system. Is there something that's just like reinforcing a particular behavior to a point where it's maybe getting better and better? So for instance, the more I exercise, the better I feel. The better I feel, the more I want to exercise that feel a good feeling reinforces my behavior of exercise it helps it like keep going and maybe increase as well right however <laughs> when i exercise too much i don't feel as good that's a negative feedback so that causes me to reduce my level of exercise okay so reinforcing feedback loop is something that like increases that particular value that we're talking about so for instance um, as level of panic goes up for whatever reason, there's a bear <laughs> at a campsite, let's say, that's going to lead to more people running. Some people are running, level of panic goes up, more people are running, and then the more people running we see, if you see everyone else running, well then panic goes up as well. <laughs> so more people run as well. So that kind of reinforces itself. That's an example there as well. So in your health promotion initiative or when you're working with individuals, you might want to ask yourself like what's what's ba what's a balancing feedback loop? Or, like what's causing people to like not go beyond their current state or to not exercise maybe enough? And then what can, if we're talking about exercise, and then what can potentially be a reinforcing feedback loop? We'll talk about reinforcing factors when we talk about the precede proceed model as well. And just to kind of end this um, lecture up, uh, I want to give you some examples of what a complex systems map looks like. So this is a system of um, equity and tobacco control. And you can make, and we're going to practice making some of these maps to kind of get an idea of all the different factors that go into particular behavior. And like listing out all the factors that go into particular behavior, sure, that helps you understand a problem. But what makes it a system is to take into account how they're linking together. It's the arrows that make it a system. And arrows going in different directions and bi-directionally as well, some that are reinforcing another factor or increasing another factor and some that are decreasing that factor as well. That's the obesity systems map. We'll see that. We saw that when we talk about obesity as well. 
And here's a map that talks about uh, climate change and greenhouse gases. And again, the common feature is that there's a lot of things that's leading to a particular outcome. And it's not about focusing on one of those factors, but it's also about focusing on how the different factors are affecting each other. And then as far as coming up with solutions for complex systems, by working with your population, by really understanding the system as well, by learning predisposing, reinforcing, and enabling factors too, things start to emerge like, oh, this is an area that we should focus on. This is an area we should focus on because it's affecting so many different things, right? Because it's reinforcing a particular behavior, because it's enabling a particular behavior, because it's predisposing to a particular behavior, right? Once we understand the system, we understand the system well. Like it's taken me... <laughs> 15 years to understand the obesity system. And now that I understand the obesity system, now I know how to like talk to people about it. And I can, when I'm talking to people about that in a coaching practice, for instance, I can start to listen to what their map looks like and create a map for them themselves. And then kind of what makes sense for solutions starts to emerge from that. And then you try it out receive feedback from that and decide on like what do we have to modify from there right so looking at thinking in systems takes more work but we're not going to get anywhere in health promotion if we're stuck in reductionist thinking simplistic thinking